Hi, I'm Dr. Bruce DiNardo in the Physics Department of the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Here is a very simple apparatus. It's a pendulum that is free to oscillate in both the X and Y horizontal directions. The system is called a spherical pendulum because the mass on the end of the string moves on the surface of a sphere that is centered at the point of support. Let's look at an orbit of small amplitude. The general motion is an ellipse, as you can see. The orbit closes on itself, so the motion repeats. Why is the orbit an ellipse? For small to moderate amplitudes, the force on the mass approximately obeys Hooke's law, which states that the force is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium. If you double the displacement, you double the force. We summarize this by saying that Hooke's law is linear. It is also common. For example, springs like this one obey Hooke's law if the turns do not touch and the spring is not overstretched during the displacement. Hooke's law has two simple consequences. The motion in a direction is sinusoidal in time and the period is the same for different amplitudes. The period is the time required for one cycle, out and back. For motion in two dimensions, the superposition of the X and Y motions yields an ellipse in general. But what happens at greater amplitudes? As you can clearly see, the orbit no longer closes on itself. The motion is not strictly an ellipse, but can be considered as a steadily rotating ellipse. This behavior is called precession. In general, the motion never repeats. This occurs even for small amplitudes, but it is much weaker, so it is difficult to notice unless you observe many revolutions of the mass. Why does the precession occur? This diagram shows a top view of the motion. For no precession, the points A and C are the same. This is what approximately happens at small amplitudes. The orbit closes on itself and the motion repeats. To gain an understanding of the precession, we need to consider a pendulum that oscillates in a plane. Here is an apparatus that will serve this purpose. I have adjusted a metronome so that it has about the same period as small amplitude oscillations of the pendulum, as you can see. If I increase the amplitude a moderate amount, the, pe the period remains approximately the same. As I said earlier, this is a result of Hooke's law here. But what happens at large amplitudes? If the pendulum starts at nearly the top, it spins a long time there, so the period is greater, as we observe with the metronome. We conclude that the period of a pendulum increases with amplitude. Only at small to moderate amplitudes is the period approximately the same. As the amplitude is increased, there is a breakdown of Hooke's law. The pendulum is an example of what is called a nonlinear oscillator. It is approximately linear only for small amplitudes. Now let's return to the top view of the spherical pendulum and think of its motion as the sum of X and Y motions. Let's start at point A. Consider one cycle of the X motion. The Y motion will not yet have completed its cycle because the period is greater, so the mass will be at some point B. At a later time, the cycle of the Y motion will be completed at C. The ellipse thus rotates and will continue to do so. This is precession. I should say that the full explanation of precession is more complicated, but our explanation is roughly correct. Does the precession only occur for a spherical pendulum? No. An important aspect of physics is what is called the unity of physics. The same or a similar phenomenon can occur in many different systems. In fact, this is a major reason why people become physicists. Bertrand's theorem states that two and only two forces yield orbits that close on themselves. One is Hooke's law, as we have seen. This is the linear force that occurs in the small amplitude motion of a pendulum. The other is an inverse square law force, which is Newtonian gravitation. The force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance. In both cases, the orbits are ellipses in general.
The elliptical orbit of the planet Mercury is observed to precess at a rate of 1.6 degrees per century as observed from the Earth. This small effect is due to the gravitational force of other planets, although the equatorial bulge of the Sun also contributes a small amount. Of the 1.6 degrees per century, there is an additional precession of 1.2 hundredths of a degree. This extremely small precession was discovered in 1859 by Le Verrier, who proposed that it was caused by a previously undiscovered planet orbiting nearer the Sun. He named the planet Vulcan. It is a sign of our times that most people know of a planet by that name from the Star Trek television series and movies, rather than from Le Verrier's hypothesis. In either case, the planet does not exist. Einstein showed that the additional precession of Mercury is due to his general theory of relativity, which causes Newton's gravitation law to be only approximately correct. And I think that Spock would agree. A spherical pendulum precesses because nonlinearity causes a breakdown of Hooke's law. Analogously, the additional precession of Mercury occurs because general relativity causes a breakdown of Newtonian gravitation. In a sense, then, we are observing the motion of Mercury here, but with a conveniently much greater precessional rate.